in a series called A Verse That Changed My Life. Uh, I've spoken on it twice. This will be my third run at it. Um, Andrew did it last week. Tonight, 6 o'clock, Danny Lehman's going to go for it. Um, we're going to have a couple of three other people coming in over the next few weeks where you can hear some other perspectives on how, how God has impacted, encountered people's lives and changed the direction of those lives with his, with his word. I mean, we're, we're people that need to have that encounter and that change. Today, just jump right into it, we're going to be looking at two verses primarily, Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. Um, this is a little bit different than the past two times that I've shared on the uh, verse that changed my life, because this is a verse, particularly these two verses, not only changed my life, but they are an ongoing aspect of change in my life, and I think they're supposed to be an ongoing aspect of change in everyone's life. Let's take a look. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9 says, this is God speaking, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I mean, this is something that we need to grapple with constantly, because we are all people predisposed to think our own thoughts, to, to come to our own conclusions on what's true, what's right, what's just, what's loving. I mean, it's something that, that we have a hard time fighting because we've all got opinions. And today, we can let everybody know what those opinions are, you know, as we throw them out there on social media. I mean, it's been, been an amazing week, right? You've heard a lot of opinions on social media this week. A lot of opinions through the media. Supreme Court, of course, this week came down with a decision that overturned Roe versus Wade. So it has been in, in the news in terms of people talking about it back and forth. Uh, what was especially interesting, of course, is the concurring opinion by Clarence Thomas in that opinion where he uh, basically said we want to do away with substantive due process, which most people have thought of as a legal fiction since it was first introduced into jurisprudence, but it's the idea that there are due process rights that are not included in the Constitution that are actually substantively inherent in just being a good person. And so with that in mind, there were things that have been legalized over the years that, that didn't have a constitutional basis, but substantive due process was the procedure by which things like um, gay marriage and, and other things were, were identified. Now, I'm not looking to throw out these things in an echo chamber where everybody claps their hands and says, yay, yay, yay. I'm telling you today, these are not the big issues before us. These are not the major issues. These issues simply point to the bigger issue of who we are as a culture, of who we are as a people, of who we're supposed to be as followers of Jesus Christ. I mean, these are all minor things that are being determined as much as anything else by, by majority viewpoints, which we all tend to adhere to based upon how we were raised, what church we attend, based on what other people say. We are people who have a predisposition to go with the majority. We always have. It doesn't matter if you're a non-Christian or a Christian, you still have that predisposition to go with what majority viewpoints are. And what Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 is supposed to teach us is we don't go with the majority. We don't go with what's in our own silly heads. We go with the revelation that God has given us on what is true, what is real, what is right, what is wrong, what is love. I mean, this is where we're supposed to be coming from. This is how we're supposed to operate, and this is something that we've got to pick up constantly and use as a gauge to test where we are. I mean, it's something that, that I've talked about for a long time in my own thinking. I, I keep telling myself, I need to be a person. I need to be a man that lives by revelation and not by speculation. Because anything that comes from the Word of God is revelation. That's what the Bible is. The Bible is the revelation of God's truth, of reality, of reality. And anything that we come up with that runs contrary to what God has said is simply speculation. That's all it is. Now, sometimes our speculation, we, we try to justify because of the group that we're a part of, because the group that we're a part of is the echo chamber that justifies the thinking that we have. The Apostle Paul is a great example, right? The Apostle Paul is in a Jewish culture. It's a Jewish echo chamber where everybody's saying Christians are bad, Jesus is a nut, kill them, get them in prison, get rid of them. And what happens? He has an encounter with God. Now, his encounter wasn't through the written word. His encounter was with Jesus face on. And what happens? He's in a place with that encounter where he's got to be ready to, to rip himself apart from, from his family, from his, his friends, 
from everything he's been told is true and everything that he thought was just and right based on the revelation that came in from God, and he did. And in a way, that's, that's how we're supposed to, supposed to be. We're in a, in a culture, we're in an age where that's not happening. It's not happening very often because instead of having black and white, right and wrong, instead of having the revelation of God, what we live by, versus the speculation of man, we've got all sorts of gray areas in between that have been, that have been brought about by a kind of Christianity uh, cafeteria line that we've developed. It's a, a cafeteria line Christianity where we've got an assortment of things we can pick from depending on what preacher, what author, what book we, we choose to listen to or read. And we go down the cafeteria line, we go, I like the Father's love, I'm taking some of that. I'm getting some of this blessing stuff that the Sermon on the Mount talks about. I'm stepping in and I'm grabbing hold of these promises of God. But no, you know, I don't want the spinach here, you know, in terms of tithing. I don't want to take the broccoli in terms of having to deal with the wrath of God. I don't want, we pick and choose all the way down the line. What's appetizing to us and what's not? And then we have people that justify it for us. We've got books, we've got preachers, we've got teachers, we've got podcasts all over the map in terms of, of qualification on what truth is all about. I mean, I've gotten to the point, and you know, you don't need to agree with this because this is my thinking, not God's. I, I think that before somebody goes to, to a class, to a, a, somebody starts a seminary, before somebody goes to, to a DTS, they need to read the whole Bible first. Before somebody reads another book, they need to read the Bible before they read the book about what the Bible says. I mean, too often we've gotten to the point where we, 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 we allow ourselves to be instructed on what the Bible says and then we develop these, these ironclad positions on what the Bible says, and we've never gotten around to reading what the Bible says. It's the idea, and I know I'm overstating it, and I know I don't, really don't believe that you should read the whole Bible before you take a Bible class, but, but wouldn't it be better if we did? I mean, wouldn't it be better if we had that exposure that, that brought us in so that we've got a filter with which we can, can determine what God says and, and what God hasn't said? What's of man where the truth has been watered down and what's of God where it's slapping us in the face and making us uncomfortable. If the truth of God doesn't sometimes make you uncomfortable, then you're not looking at the truth of God because he's in the business of shaping and changing us. It's what this is supposed to be all, all about. I mean, it's, it's the idea that God has said, look, you've got your thinking, you've got your reasoning, it's not mine. It's not mine. Your natural thinking, my natural thinking, my natural reasoning is not going to be the same as God's. God's comes in by revelation. Ours is what we create for ourselves. It's why we've got to be people that seek him. I mean, do a little word study sometime on seeking God. And, and look how often it comes up with that, that encouragement to seek him, to seek his face, to seek his voice, to seek what he has to say, to seek what he has to reveal. It, it's, why, it's why that we're kind of big here in encouraging people to have daily quiet times, meaning daily times, every day, every single day, where you get your Bible out and you read your Bible for a period of time. Why? So that you can hear firsthand, see firsthand what God has revealed in his word. I mean, you can get those little guidepost magazine clips or the whatever, the little daily word, I forget what they're called, that we have out there sometimes at the table. Fine and good, but don't even read those until you've read the Bible. I mean, don't trust what other people say until you've looked for yourself at, at what the word actually, actually says. Again, we just love our, our own thoughts so much and we have trouble thinking that God couldn't agree with the way we think because we think we're so smart. Now, Andrew did a great job, I thought, last week, especially with that closing video where he had the, the, the earth and then the progression that came out as we finally got up to the black holes. I mean, it was just awe-inspiring, the bigness of God. And, and that's just like a teeny glimpse of the bigness of God and how much bigger he is than us in the way that we think. And yet we go through this process intellectually decision-making where we think that he thinks the way we think just a little bit better. And he doesn't just think a little bit better. He says it's completely other than, completely other than. We can't get it. 
we're not going to get it unless it comes by revelation. Other than that, otherwise, it, it's, it's simply speculation. It's stuff that we've concocted and come up with our, our, ourselves. I mean, the next time, I heard Francis Chan say this one time. He said, the next time somebody comes up to you and says, do you want to know what I think about that? You need to say, No. It doesn't matter what you think about that. I don't care what you think about that. I don't care what I think about that. The only thing that matters is what God says about that. It, it, I mean, how much simpler would life be if we actually, I mean, I know, I know, that's rude, but how much simpler would life be if we actually did get to the point where we just told people, I don't care what you think because I don't even care what I think. The only thing that matters is what God thinks. I mean, talk about maintaining unity of the Holy Spirit. Would that, would that give us a giant step in the right direction? I mean, I, I think so. I mean, tell somebody to show you chapter and verse where God has said that. I mean, there's a lot of areas where there's not chapter and verse. And then you just acknowledge, this is all speculation then, but we can have fun talking about it. it it's the idea that we, we've got to get, I think, serious about it and understand that God revealed these two verses to let us know that, that it does make, make a difference. Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. It says there, guard your steps as you go to the house of God and draw near to listen to God rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know they're doing evil. Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. I mean, <laughs> the idea is that, that we blather on and God says, God says, you're a fool. You're a fool. If you want to just throw your opinions out, your ideas out, and continue to just talk, 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 rather than listen to what I've got to say. I'm talking about God, not me. Listen to what the Word of God has to say. It's what makes all the, all the difference in, in the world for us. Instead of, again, offering the sacrifice of fools. I mean, again, I'm kind of soapboxed today. It's, it's the idea that we've got so many books out there offering new perspectives on, on Scripture. So many teachings out there that, that dispense with old interpretations for a more nuanced approach in keeping with today's culture, with the argument that we've got we've to approach these things differently in order to maintain relevance with the culture for today. The reality is the only relevance that matters is the revelation of God. Everything else is irrelevant. There's nothing relevant about trying to please a person. There's nothing relevant about trying to get, get somebody to come and sit still in a seat in here on Sunday by saying things that they're going to want to hear. That's not the idea. Now, now, you know, there needs to be kindness. There needs to be gentleness. There needs to be encouragement. There needs to be hope. Yes, all of that laid out. But the idea is, again, that, that we, we need to be people that understand that, that the only thing that is relevant are the things that touch on the big things that God wants us touching on, understanding that there's a bigger picture under which all the little things lie. And basically, what I'm getting to has been a soft opening. This is a soft opening for the bigger issue. The bigger issue is that we have in front of us heaven or hell. The bigger issue is that one of the big issues that God looks at that we're supposed to be concerned with is something called the wrath of God. He lays it out there in Scripture over 600 times. And it's something that we just let go of completely because, again, we're concerned that that's going to make us irrelevant. We're concerned that that's going to put people off. First two services, first time in a long time, we've had people walk out of the service. You know, it actually made me feel good. It used to happen all the time. It used to happen all the time. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? But, but finally, I think we're hitting on what maybe the Holy Spirit wants to hit on as, as people start getting a little bit offended and, and leaving again. It, it's something, though, I'm not looking for that. It, it's something, though, that, that we've got to focus our attention on. As I said, the issues for the day, whether it's abortion, which... I mean, in my opinion, and I think can be extracted from the Word of God, is, is horrible, something that should not happen. I mean, you go on with sexual identity issues, other things. I've got my opinions on it. Based on Scripture, you do too. But I do not think those are the issues that we're supposed to live or die on. We're supposed to live or die on the eternity that lies before every person. 
We're supposed to live or die on whether somebody's going to heaven or hell. We're supposed to live or die on the idea that the wrath of God is there for everyone who rejects the gift that Jesus Christ made available from the cross and who has rejected following him in consequence of that, that salvation that was offered to us. Let's take a look at Isaiah 66.2. Isaiah 66.2 says, for my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look. To him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. Okay, let's just stop there for a second on that. Tremble at my word. I mean, how, how often have we been told recently that we're supposed to tremble at the word of God? That we're supposed to have a fear of God. And when it is coming up, the fear of God is, is like, in my perspective, from my perspective, is sugar-coated when we're said, well, that just means have an awe of God, of his bigness. Yeah, I have an awe of his bigness, a bigness that can send you to hell for eternity. I mean, that's something to be afraid of. It's something to fear. It's why we work at our salvation with fear and trembling, not because it's a work salvation, but because as we work out our salvation, it's an evidence of whether we have been saved or not. It means that we have changed, that we have a new mind, a new heart, that things are going to happen in us differently than they did before. This is, this is something that needs to be taken seriously by us. We don't like it. We don't think that sounds very nice. We don't think that a loving father would do that. What do we have to do? We've got to change our definition of love to go along with the definition that God provides of love. We've got to go along with the definitions that he provides on who he is, what he does, and how we're to think. We've got to go along with Isaiah 55, 8, and 9, where we acknowledge in humility that Isaiah 66, 2 points to, in humility that says, God, I don't get it. It doesn't feel right to me, but, but I know my feelings are all messed up. I know that my thinking apart from you, is all messed up. And so I'm going to live by the revelation that you make, and I'm going to confess that anything else is simply human speculation that, that is just going to get me into trouble. And, and this is where he, he says this is what we, we do. We, we tremble at his word. We take it seriously. We, we intentionally go after those areas where we can change our minds about the way we've lived to line up with the way he says he wants us to live. I mean, what would happen? What would happen right now if, if this moment, you folks outside can't identify with this, but try to imagine it. You folks inside can imagine it more clearly. What would happen right now if suddenly four angels ripped the roof off the, the building here, they ripped the roof off the building, and God speaks in and says whatever he wants to say. He speaks down to us. Let's just take an example. He speaks out, I want you, my children, Livingstone's Church, I want you, and he starts naming names, I want you to pursue the gifts of the Holy Spirit, especially that you may prophesy. How many of you would start getting really serious about pursuing the gifts of the Spirit and especially that you may prophesy? I mean, Go on and go wild in your imagination in terms of scripture that is there that God has said, and imagine that being the voice that speaks down. And you know it's not thunder, it's the voice of God that speaks down and, and speaks those words that are already written down to you and me right now. Would you pay attention? Would you change the way you live? Would you give up the way you're thinking and go along with the way God is saying we're supposed to think? Well, yeah, of course you would. But... But this is what he's already said we're supposed to do with this. It's, it's the word. It is the written word. Yeah, there's parts of it we can struggle with, but there's enough of it that's clear that we should know what to do with so much of it. It's as clear as if he did speak or should be for us as clear as if, as if he, he did speak and have our, lines, our lives line up with, with what he said. I mean, the idea with Isaiah... 55, 8, and 9 to me, is to ask myself, where are you speaking to me to, to apply it this week? Where are you speaking to me to apply it now? Where do I need to apply it? 
where do I need to apply it as I look at, at abortion, as I look at, 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 at you know, same-sex marriage, as I look at sexual identity issues? Where do I need to apply it? How do I need to apply it in terms of how I'm supposed to be addressing these things? I mean, am I going to change people's minds that, that aren't followers of Jesus by pounding into them that their position is wrong and mine is right? No, they don't get it. It, you've got to have a new mind. You've got to be born again. You've got to have a different heart. I mean, we're wasting time. We're wasting effort and energy. We're, we're, we're not stewarding what God has given us if those are the things that we feel like we need to be pounding people on. All we're doing is closing their ears to the reality of what is important, Jesus, of what will ultimately bring changes in the way people live, but we've got this, this politicized concept that we need to change the way people live before they ever find Jesus. It doesn't work. I mean, it's why, it's why, okay, when I was born, did I tell you this yet? I get confused between the services. Okay, when I was born, abortion was illegal. Marriage was seen as between a man and a woman only. It was ridiculous to think of anything else. Divorce was frowned upon and made very difficult by our legal system. Various views of sex and gender were viewed as mental disorders. Now, that was all in place up until 1974, actually, with the mental disorders. Okay, so what happened? What happened was simply a shift in culture, not on particular issues, but away from Jesus. That's what happened. And now we've got this screwed up idea that if we can just get everybody to shift back on the issues, Jesus is going to be happy. I don't think Jesus cares. I think what he wants to see are people saved coming to him and then the issues get, get straightened out. I mean, we're getting, we're getting things so ass backwards. I'm sorry. We're getting things so messed up with this. We're getting it all backwards in terms of how we're supposed to. <laughs> Let no impure word. Okay, no, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I need, to, I need to not do that. It's the idea. The idea is that he wants the focus on the things that we're to focus on. And I think the enemy is having a heyday. As Christians turn to hate, as they turn to ridicule, as they turn to all sorts of, again, politicized methods to try to get some kind of feel-good society in place, that is a farce. I mean, that's why between the time I was born and today... We're in the situation that we're in as a culture. It's not because politicians lost their spine. It's because the church lost its spine in terms of Jesus being the answer and salvation being the necessary step before any other changes can happen. And it's where we need to be. I mean, we need to be handling things the way we're supposed to handle all of these things. And... It's seeing that we take Isaiah 55, 8, and 9, and we ask ourselves, where do I need to apply it? I need to ask myself that constantly, obviously with my language, but other areas, you know, you need to ask yourself, where do you need to apply Isaiah 55, 8, and 9 today? Is it with the gifts of the Holy Spirit? I mean, maybe so. You've, you've thought about so many ways in which the gifts of the Holy Spirit have gotten people into trouble, and it's just, you know, so ridiculous what people say are the gifts, and it's just somebody prancing around, you know, putting on a show. Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's sexual identity or, or sexual morality. You know, you've got your excuses for whatever. You're going you're gonna to focus on, you know, this brand of sexual immorality while you're sleeping with somebody who's not your spouse. And you're going, well, at least I'm not. Well, no, all of it's actually spoken about in the same sentence, you know. Whether it's heterosexual, homosexual, whatever, it's all spoken about in the same sentence. In fact, in fact, you want to go even further with that in terms of what we do or how we apply it. Again, it's just in our thinking in general. I mean, the verses in Scripture that we're talking about that talk about sexual immorality, which is such a hot issue that everybody wants to talk about as a Christian, almost always lists idolatry in with sexual immorality. Now, what's idolatry? Idolatry is where you have placed something in preeminence over God. Where are the biggest idols in the Christian world today? Right here, between our ears as we have brains, as we have minds, as we have thinking that put ourselves in preeminence over what God has said. That is idolatry. We need to tremble at that. We need to be afraid. We need to fear. We need to question our salvation. We need to look at what's going on with that. 
We need to say, why am I thinking, saying what I think and say when God has thought and said something completely different? It's, it's again, it, where we need to apply it is to ourselves, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. Where we need to apply it is not to those people who are doing those things that we think are awful, but to ourselves. Let's talk about tithing. You want to get really, really uncomfortable? Money? Okay. The Bible actually does talk about tithing. You can go into the Old Testament, New Testament argument. We can talk about it separately, but the Bible says tithe. Generosity, go for it. And what happens? Well, today in the United States, I looked up the statistics a couple of days ago, across the board with non-believers, people who are not Christians, this includes drug dealers and you know, business people that are in legitimate businesses, their generosity level is 2%. They give away 2% of what they bring in. Evangelical Christians, you know what they give away? 3.5%. I mean, we're not even twice as good as a drug dealer, right? I mean, 3.5%. And we think this is okay. And we go, okay, 10% is 10%. And you go, well, okay, you're just trying to get money. I've told you before, I, you give your money wherever you want to give it, throw it out the window, give it to somebody, but get rid of 10% just because God says so. Just because God says so. And then we'll talk about actually how it's a lot more than 10%, but not, not today. But the, the idea is that, you know, if, if we're serious about it, where do we need to apply it? And where has, and this is what I'm talking about, whether it's sexual immorality, whether it's tithing, whether it's bad language, whatever, where have you justified it up here and failed to understand that the justification up here is idolatry? You go, well, nobody's going to be distanced or separated from God because they didn't do this, that, or the other. They will if it's idolatry. It's, it's again, not, not, a works, not a works salvation. It's the recognition that real salvation is going to bring submission to God. And we're not going to get it perfectly. I mean, we're not going to get it right. We're going to continue to have messed up lives for the rest of the time we're here on this earth. But, but it's a process of submitting of continually submitting, acknowledging his ways are, are higher than, than my ways. And again, the idea that if God is a loving God, why in the world would he have so much in the Bible that we're supposed to really pay attention to about wrath? Why would there be such a place as hell? Well, again, it's because we've come up with our own definitions of what love is, of what goodness is, of what what, what justice is, and, and God has said something completely different, and, and we try to ignore it and hide it, and I mean, when was the last time you heard a really good fire and brimstone sermon? It's been a while, probably. I mean, it's because over the past 20 years, again, we've, we've moved into the, the understanding, or the idea, I should say, that we, we want to be people that don't run people off. We want to be friendly to people coming in so that they, they sit long enough to listen. We want to be Seeker sensitive, all sorts of phrases we can use, but the, the idea is we compromise truth in the process of it. I, I don't think we're supposed to preach, that I'm supposed to preach, or anybody is supposed to preach fire and brimstone every week or every month even. But we've got to do it frequently enough to understand the context within which everything else lies. The context, the big picture, is about eternity. It's about the consequences of how life is lived with heaven or hell at, at, the, at the end of it, of it all. It's something we don't see a lot of, that is, looking at the wrath of God in heaven and hell, because we don't read all of the Bible, but, but simply the selected portions that we, we find comfortable. Uh, when I was growing up, actually, it was a normal thing to hear about heaven and hell. Maybe a little too much, I don't know. But, but it's something that actually stuck with me. I mean, I, I was raised in a, a, a church that, that preached the word and it didn't stick with me completely because I went on for like my late teen years up until, you know, halfway through my 20s living a lifestyle that evidenced that I was not saved and I was destined for hell. I then did come to salvation. I, I submitted my life to Jesus. I confessed him as my savior. The real reason I did it was because I believed there was hell in front of me. That's why I did it. Now, my perspective broadened after that, to an understanding more completely of what the love of God was all about, of what relationship with him was all about. But it was, I don't know if you want to call it the carrot on the stick, but, 
but heaven as opposed to hell was the carrot on the stick in front of me that, that caused me to pay attention to what God was saying. Now, I kind of think that's true for a lot of people, whether they admit it or not, that, that it's the reason Jesus said it so much. It's the reason Jesus talked about the wrath of God in hell more than anybody else in the Bible talked about it. He goes on and gets into to great detail about it. And again, we, we tend to step back and ignore parts of it. It's kind of like Noah's Ark. I mean, we've talked about this before. Most Sunday schools got a great mural on the wall with Noah's Ark on it. And it's always such a cute thing with the elephant. And then you've always got a, always a giraffe sticking out the window, you know, somewhere. Very cute and very true. You know, God brought the animals in two by two and saved Noah's entire family. But again, what part do we block out of the story? The millions of screaming people drowning and dying, you know, around the ark. You don't ever see that on a Sunday school wall. Now, nor should we. Well, we don't want to do that with the kids. But, but it's, it's part of the whole truth that comes into, into the picture with this. Jesus, again, we, we don't always present the whole truth that, that he lays out. I mean, just think of, think of his parables, one in particular. Just look at Luke chapter 16. You got the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Some people say it's not a parable because he named the guy's name Lazarus. I don't know, but, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's a parable or not because it was Jesus speaking truth. So either way. But what's going on? You got Lazarus, poor guy. He's in, in paradise, in heaven. And you've got, you've got the rich guy who's in Hades. And the rich guy is in flames and in torment, and he's asking for a drop of water to be placed on his tongue. Send Lazarus over and let him drop the water on my tongue. And, and he's told, can't happen. There's too big a gap between the two that gap can never be spanned. And Jesus is telling this story to do what? <laughs> to get our attention. To get our attention of, of heaven and hell. To get our attention of an eternal destiny that cannot be bridged. To get our attention with the understanding that the determination of the location, heaven or hell, is one that's made in this life and is irrevocable once we get into this life. Once we pass through this life. Now, the one thing that... that strikes me, and maybe it struck, struck you before too, is here we are 2,000 some odd years down the road, and assuming that wasn't a parable, that rich guy is still wanting that drop of water, and he's never gotten it, and he never will, and he's only 2,000 some odd years into eternity. I mean, have you ever pondered eternity? If you want to wake yourself up with, you know, trembles at night, think about what, what eternity is, 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 is really all about. So, again, but what about love? Well, assuming that the wrath of God and the, the judgment of God is true, the most loving thing we can do is warn people against these things. The most loving thing that the Father does, that Jesus did, is to warn us against it. Let's look, though, at what, what God has said about it. Have you read Nahum lately? Nahum? Chapter 1, verses 2 to 6. Let's look at it. A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. This is God describing himself. He's a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger. This is good news for us. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And the whirlwind and storm is his way and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither the blossoms of Lebanon wither, mountains quake because of him, and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence, the world and all its inhabitants in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken up by him. Horrible. Sounds bad. And some people, many people, will go, that's Old Testament. That's Old Testament. God's different now. Jesus changed everything. Jesus did change everything, but not God's disposition towards unrighteousness and and sin. So let's real quickly look at some New Testament verses just to make sure he's the same in the New Testament that he was in the Old. Romans chapter 2, verses 4 to 8. Romans 2, 4 to 8. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each person 
according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. Now again, you look at that and go, that's scary, but it sounds like that's talking about works righteousness, which I've been told isn't something that we need to be concerned about because we're saved by grace through faith. Yes, absolutely. We are saved by grace through, <clears throat> by grace through faith. The, the idea here, and we're going to look at one other section of Scripture on this too, is that this is something that speaks to people who reject Jesus. But again, this is something to people who, some people, some people, I hope none are here, that think they have Jesus, but they've continued to live as they have chosen to live because they've followed the idol of their minds. And in truth, they have gone through some form of acceptance and not the reality. This is why Paul says to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. You go, well, can't I ever be sure? Yeah, you can. God wants us to have that assurance of our salvation. Read 1 John. But the idea is, is that, that if, if your life is no different now than it was before you claim to be a Christian, then, then there's reason to question what actually happened or if anything actually did happen. And, and this is the most loving thing that I can say or that anybody can say to you to, to make sure what the situation is in which you, you find yourself. And, well, I'm running out of time here. Revelation chapter 21, let's look at it anyway. Revelation chapter 21, <clears throat> 1 to 8 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done on the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son and here's the divine conjunction, but, but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and, and sexually immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their parts will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This is the New Testament. This is the same as the Old Testament. This is a God who is loving and good, who is holy and and what's justice. And it's something that is uncomfortable. And it's something that at the same time, no matter how uncomfortable we, we find it, is, is something we need to accept. You know, it, it, it's the idea we have so often is as we look at the Old Testament, we think that because God has not shown up throwing fireballs of tar down to the earth like he did in Sodom and Gomorrah, that, that it must be that God isn't true, the Bible isn't true, or God just to change his mind, he doesn't care anymore. And, and the reality is, no, he's, he's patient, he's kind, he's waiting, he said that. He revealed to us that that's the attitude that he has so that we choose life, so that we choose Jesus, so that we choose heaven. I mean, there are a lot of questions that I know you could ask about heaven and hell. I can't answer all those questions. The Bible, though, the Bible tells us all that we need to know about heaven and hell and the wrath of God. It does not tell us all that we want to know, but it tells us all that we need to know. And so, again, go back to Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. You go, well, I need to know more than that. No, you don't. God has given you all that you need to know. He's given us all that we need to know, and, and we're supposed to be people that, that deal with that. I mean, in, in the final analysis, as we look to eternal life, everyone has two options. Option number one, stay like you are and go to hell. Option number two, go to Jesus now. Go to Jesus now. It, it's as simple as that, really. It's all that's really required for us, and, 
the idea for us is that we need to, to respond that way. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost as the Holy Spirit falls, as the Holy Spirit made clear to him things that he'd been taught by Jesus before the Holy Spirit came. And he preaches a sermon in Acts chapter 2 that shakes people up, that causes people to tremble at God. And we have, maybe we've got all of his sermon there, maybe it's only part of his sermon, but whatever, what we do see is that people responded to his sermon in Acts chapter 2 verse 37 by saying, hey, what shall we do? What shall we do? And in Acts 2.38, he said, this is what you do. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What, what we, we see is that we are to be people who believe and receive Jesus. We are to turn from sin, and the biggest one is from our own patterns of thinking and following our own sense of, of right, wrong, and what's rational and reasonable. And we submit to God, and we get water baptized. Now, there are some of you here today, some of you online perhaps, where the, the thing that needs to be done is decide what you're going to do with Jesus. Now, okay, for a minute, forget about Christianity or Christians. It's not about Christians. Most of us are jerks. It's not about Christianity as a whole. It's about Jesus. It's about what are you going to do with Jesus? And then from that, there comes then an opening up with a softening of heart, a new mind that enables you to step into the greater fullness of what God has in terms of following Jesus. Now, for those of you that have already received Jesus, if you've been baptized and you're in the place where you're moving ahead with that following of Jesus, if you are someone who has received Jesus as Savior, but you have not been water baptized, then I would go so far as to say you're not a follower of Jesus. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm not saying you're going to hell, but you're not a follower of Jesus. Because baptism is the first thing that we see in Acts. Baptism is the first thing Jesus did before he started his ministry. He got baptized himself. He humbled himself for baptism. Peter said, get yourselves baptized. And for you, if you've been putting it off, if you thought, I'm too old, I've gone past what I needed to do, I should have done it when I was younger, but I'm not going to humiliate myself now because I, I don't want to step into that, then you need to. You need to. Take your first step of following Jesus. You can do it today. It's not too late. Yeah, you'll get your clothes wet. Big deal. It's... <laughs> It's, again, get the big picture perspective on this. Understand what we're talking about and what's at stake. It's about an eternity with God. I mean, we're, I'm, I'm going to be quiet now, but, but it's, so, it, it's, it's so silly. I, I, I'm, I'm 66 years old. Okay, some of you are older. A lot of you are older than that. Some of you are younger than that. But, but the idea is this. We think in this narrow span of time that we've lived that we have had enough experiences and we've been able to think through things in, in sufficient measure where we can come up with things that cause us not to follow or believe what God has said. I mean, think about that. The enormity of, of the eternal creator of the universe and we're putting ourselves up there where we can dare to even question what he has to say. It's, well, God uses the word. It's foolishness. It's foolishness. Father, we thank you for your patience with us, for your love for us, for the revelation of your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. And we ask you today, I ask you today, continue, Holy Spirit, to change me, to enable me to take Isaiah 55, 8, and 9, and to just admit that there are areas where I've got to let go and submit because your ways are higher than my ways and your thinking is higher than my thinking. I ask that you move in power amongst all of us this week, Holy Spirit, as you enable us to go through that process of transformation. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.